Great. All right. So um, just our agenda is I'm going to review some basic information about the program, and then we'll introduce our current teachers who are here with us today. Um, they'll each chime in on some different topics uh, about teaching, about private tutoring, finding an apartment, all sorts of fun things that you might be wondering about. Uh, and then at the end, you can ask them whatever questions you guys have. Uh, and if you're having any issues with the sound, definitely let me know. Um, but it might work if you log out and log back in again. Uh, all right, so let's get started. Oops, I don't know why it's doing that. There we go. All right. Um, so I just wanted to start with a brief uh, intro to that there's many different ways to teach abroad. You can independently find a job. You can use a recruiter hired by foreign schools. Or you can go through a program provider like CIEE. CIE, uh, it's more than just a job. It's a whole kind of comprehensive package built around teaching abroad. Um, we do have a fee, but we give you a lot of support before you go and then while you're in the country. Um, so that's just a brief introduction to some of the things that CIE includes. Um, and of course, I'd be happy to talk with you more about it uh, later. Our different programs in Spain, we have a lot of different programs in Spain. The big three are Teach in Spain, Teach in Spain the Basics, and Teach in Spain Language Immersion. Um, all three of these have the exact same teaching position. Um, and then the professional program and the volunteer program are a little bit smaller and a little bit more different. Um, they don't require uh, Spanish speaking experience. Um, and they're more directed to people who maybe want a shorter experience or are looking to do more business-oriented um, teaching. So our big three are what we're going to talk about today, the Teach in Spain, the Teach in Spain, the Basics, and the Teach in Spain Language Immersion. All three of these programs, you have an academic year contract as a language and culture assistant, uh, which is basically an English teaching assistant in public uh, schools in the region of Madrid, which is the city of Madrid and its suburbs and some more rural areas. It's not a huge region. Um, you'll probably be within an hour and a half of the city of Madrid, uh, if not much closer. Um, all three of these programs, you get paid a 1,000 euro stipend from the Spanish government uh, each month. Um, and for all of these programs, you are responsible for your own long-term housing. Um, though, the, depending on the program, there might be some housing included when you arrive. Oh, there we go. So the job, you are going to be working as a language and culture assistant. Basically, like I said, an English teaching assistant. Um, you might be teaching not just in English classes, but in classes of many different subjects, such as history or art or phys ed, it's all part of this bilingual program through the Spanish government where they're trying to make public schools, certain public schools, entirely bilingual. Um, so you'll be helping the Spanish students integrate English language activities and instruction into their entire education. You'll be working 16 hours per week, uh, and that's in classroom teaching time. Um, there might be a few more hours per week for faculty meetings or um, activity and lesson prep and commuting. Uh, but you are going to have a fair amount of free time for traveling, for studying Spanish, uh, picking up pride, uh, private uh, tutoring clients. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do while you're in Spain. All right. But you don't want to hear from me. Let's hear from our current participants. All right, I am going to unmute all four of you. Um, feel free to chime in on your slides, OK? All right, let's get going. Start with Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, obviously, my name's Hannah. I am from Westfield, Indiana, and I went to Butler. I just graduated this past May with a double major in science, technology, and Spanish. And I'm not sure what else to say. Uh, those are my two dogs, and I miss them a lot, but they're pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, that's good. That's a good introduction. Um, tell us a <laughs> brief something that you love about Madrid. Oh, what I love about Madrid? There's always something to do. So whether you want to go get something to eat or go to a museum or volunteer. There's always something to do and always something to see, which is always keeping me busy, which I love. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll hear from you more in just a bit. Let's move on to Alex. Alexandra, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Alexandra. I'm from Tallinn, Connecticut. And I went to school at GW, and I just graduated this past May. Um, I love exploring Madrid and finding new places to eat and visit. And there's so many restaurants around here. So there's a lot to see <laughs> and um, eat, obviously. <laughs> and um, so I was also in the teach. I've been teaching Spain basics. And I took TEFL, the TEFL course with CIE over the summer. Cool. Do you have a favorite restaurant in Madrid? Um, we recently discovered an Italian restaurant. I know that sounds, you know, <laughs> that's ironic because we're in Spain, but um, my Italian friend said it's just as good as Spain, I mean Italy, and I took my parents there the other night and they said it was amazing. So <laughs> definitely I'll be returning there. That's good. <laughs> that's good to have a variety yeah. of food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cool. And GW is my alma mater, so cool to hear from oh, you. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. And uh, Rebecca, Rebecca, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Rebecca. This is actually my third time around in Spain, second time teaching through CIEE. Uh, about mm, a year and a half ago, I graduated with my master's in international education. And after working full-time for a year, I decided to come back over to Spain. Um, I love traveling, obviously, and one of the things that I love about Madrid is that it's so incredibly easy to travel pretty much anywhere and everywhere from here. They've got a great airport and public transportation system um, and lots of options. Cool. What uh, airline do you fly the most? <laughs> um, probably Ryanair because Ryanair, it's, it's yeah. very cheap. Yeah. <laughs> they just you have to watch out for those hidden fees. Yes. Yeah, so once you know where those are, it sells pretty cheap. It's not <laughs> the only one that I fly, but definitely most often. Cool. Well, thanks. All right. And last but not least, Christy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Christy, if you can hear us, introduce Okay. Us. Hey, guys. I'm Christy, <laughs> and I'm from Augusta. Well, Christy, you're... Hey, can you hear coming? me? Yeah, there you are. Hello? Hi. I think it's a, maybe a bit of a delay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi. Sorry. I'm not sure why my sound isn't working. Uh, um, but if you can hear me, hey guys, I'm Christy, and I'm, I'm from Augusta, Georgia, and I graduated from Presbyterian College, and I studied psychology, and some of my favorite things to do in Spain is traveling, hiking, um, I really like salsa dancing, that's a fun part of the culture here, and I love going for tapas with friends. What's your favorite tapa that you always get? Oh, gosh. Tapa huevos rotos, which is um, French fries with eggs and ham on top. I absolutely love it. <laughs> that sounds delicious. Cool. Well, thank you, Christy. All right. Let's get into um, the different topics we're going to have everyone talk about. Um, we've broken it up into some major categories, and different uh, current teachers are going to chime in. Uh, and then you guys can definitely uh, ask your questions related to the topic. Otherwise, I'll uh, save other unrelated questions until the end. All right. Thank you. All right. First, the TEFL course. Alexandra, would you mind telling us a bit about your experience taking the TEFL course? Yeah, so um, I started the TEFL course back at the end of May, and you do it through about two months. Uh, it's, I think, 12 weeks. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, uh, I believe it's an 11-week online experience, not counting the in-class or the practicum. Yeah, so I did that during the summer, and I really liked how I could do the work wherever I was. So I know I was traveling out over the summer, and I could just hop onto my computer and um, come into class or do some of the work when I had a chance. Um, the practicum was really interesting, and it really 
gets you into the classroom to um, apply what you've been learning. And I found that as I progressed with the TEFL course that I could create um, lessons better and I felt more confident in the classroom. And even now after I've been in Spain for the last five months, I can truly say that the TEFL course really helped me, um, yeah, has really helped me t uh, create lesson plans and make uh, the class fun and make sure it's not boring or, and it makes me feel confident in my teaching. Cool. So, yeah. You're not at a loss if there's downtime in the class. You can throw yeah. together an activity. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> cool. Cool. And how many hours a week do you think people should spend on the TEFL course? Uh, I think it really depends on how you learn and um, how you take notes. I found one of the most important things is at the end of each um, module, they had already put the most important stuff in, um, in a document. Mm -hmm. So once I actually discovered that, I found that I didn't have to take notes, like writing everything down as I was taking the lesson, but print those out at the end, to print the information that was at the end of the lesson and then go through it as I was um, going through the modules. Sorry, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, but I think it would definitely take about for probably like 10 to 15 hours a week, depending mm -hmm. on your pace. Yeah, okay. I think that's usually what we recommend. I, I think our TEFL team usually compares it to the amount of work of a, like, one college class. Exactly. Perfect. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. Let's uh, move on to uh, Christy. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience when you arrived in Spain and you did the immersion? Yeah. So it's a part two week immersion and, and so when I first arrived to Spain I um, stayed while we took Spanish classes at um, a school called Tandem and honestly for me um, I had a really great experience with my homestay um, over to Spain, I was not very conversational in Spanish at all. Um, I could barely say, like, oh. <laughs> so I honestly did so much in those two weeks, and that was part of my biggest growth since I've been here in Spanish. Because, um, I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with host mom, um, and she didn't speak any English at all. So I was forced to speak Spanish every day, and then while taking classes, I was um, immersed in learning Spanish throughout the day. So it was, it was really such a great time for my growth in, um, in the Spanish language, and I really had a great experience. Awesome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your host family or your host mother? Um, yes, so I had a host mother, um, and she was super, super nice. She would cook us breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, and all her meals were amazing. It was really a great experience to stay with a local, um, because during that time, I really got to know more about the authentic Spanish culture and um, she also was such a great help for me when I was looking for um, my search and she knew the best places to go and um, it was great to have that time to um, live with a local. Awesome. and. Um yeah, great. And how many hours a day did you spend in the Spanish classes? Um, I think our class was three hours a day. So um, I would eat breakfast with my host mom, and then I would go to class, and then I would come back, um, and we would hang out with her on the evenings. 
Cool. And did you use that time during your immersion to also do any exploring of Madrid or apartment hunting? What else did you do while you were living with the host family? Um, yes. So my one of the best parts about um, living with the host family is it gave me extra time to look for an apartment, which was super, super helpful because it made the whole situation um, so much less stressful. And I had time um, after class to go apartment searching and explore all the neighborhoods in Madrid. And that way I could really um, get to know the different vibes of the neighborhood and really figure out where it was that I wanted to live and what part of Madrid fit me best. And um, that was one of the most helpful parts of the homestay experience. Cool. Great. Well, thank you so much. All right. Let's get on to the next one. Next, we have, similarly, finding an apartment. Both Hannah and Rebecca, um, I figured you guys could both kind of mention briefly your experience. This is definitely what people worry about the most in going to Spain. Uh, Hannah, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, I was kind of in the same boat. I was super nervous to find an apartment, um, but I was pretty lucky. I found an apartment during my stay, like my orientation with CIEE. -E. Um, so as soon as my stay at the hotel ended, I was able to move right into my apartment, um, which was really nice. I used a website called Idealista, which you can go on and search at home, but I would recommend waiting until you got to Spain so you can actually go and see the apartment. Um, the website, you can put in like your price range. You can search different neighborhoods or locations. Um, you can say if you want it to be furnished, which I obviously would recommend because you don't want to be buying a bed and all that stuff. Um, but it's really, really helpful and there's so many apartments everywhere in Madrid, which is really nice. Oh, and I do not recommend going through an agency. Okay. I know some people have gone through agencies and are happy, but you have to pay like an extra month Ugh. rent for their commission. Um, and if you want to do that, it's and you have the money to do it, why not? Um, it takes a little bit of the stress off of you yourself trying to find it because you have people searching for apartments for you. But I know for me, I came in with a budget and I didn't have that built into my budget, so I wouldn't have been able to do it. And it's definitely doable by yourself. Cool. Well, thanks. That sounds like it was not a terribly painful process for you. I know it's definitely I something it was that... stressful. Yeah. But it was. <laughs> Good. How many do you say that it fa that you found an apartment within two days of looking, four days of looking? How long did it um, take you? Yeah, so I had actually met two girls at orientation on the very first day, and we kind of all just decided to live together. So we started looking for apartments the second day of being in Spain, and yep. we looked at three apartments before the apartment that we're in now. Um, so it probably took us about a week because you see the online posting on Idealista and then you have to contact the landlord and set up a time to come and see it. So there's a little bit of a process, but if you have patience, like it's really not as stressful as I thought it was going to be at all. That's good. Good to hear. All right. Thank you. And uh, Rebecca, what was your experience both the first and second time you went to teach in Spain? <laughs> I had very different experiences both times. The first time I taught in Spain, I taught in Huelva, which is a smaller city about an hour outside of Sevilla. So that time it only took me about five days to find an apartment. And I did the regular Teach in Spain program, so the time that I had in the hotel was enough time for me to find an apartment. This time around, I did the Teach in Spain basics program. So we only had a couple of nights 
in the hotel, which I, I knew from my previous experience wasn't going to be enough. Um, in the CIE Facebook group, I met up with some of the other girls in my area of Chicago before coming over, which was nice because then we had some people that we knew already and we were able to book an Airbnb for a week after orientation in order to keep looking for housing. Idealista was definitely our go-to place as well. Um, however, we arrived at the end of September with the Teach in Spain program and it was definitely a little chaotic at that time trying to find a place because there were so many people looking for apartments at the same time. I think it took me a little over a week to find a place so I had to book a second um, Airbnb but it, it wound up working out well. I would highly recommend downloading WhatsApp before you come over, um, Google Maps as well. Those are both extremely handy. You'll want to be the first person to WhatsApp message, call, and email a landlord as soon as an apartment comes online if you don't have the luxury of the month long from the um, other programs or the week or, or whatnot. Um, I wound up staying with a Spanish family for my first few months. And then I found another apartment in January because my husband was also moving to Spain. So it was an adventure, but it wasn't horrible. <laughs> I would say it's definitely the part of moving abroad that has people most nervous. Um, what would your top, and this is to all four of you, what is your top recommendation for people when apartment hunting? Feel free I to think be, be, quick, be quick on your feet. Um, try to go see a place right away. Download, like I said, um, WhatsApp, Google Maps, and the Idealista as well, and sign up for notifications so you're alerted right away whenever a new place within your search parameters comes up. Cool. Honest? Yeah, I really, I, uh, whenever I would see an apartment that looked nice, I would message the landlord right away and try and see the apartment. Um, when you go and see an apartment and you think that it's going to be the one, I would recommend bringing money with you. So when me and my roommate saw our apartment, we toured it and we immediately knew that we wanted it and we told him right then and there that we wanted it and so we signed a contract and put our down payment in, which is lucky because he had other people coming in mm. right after us. So if we had waited, we might not have gotten the apartment. So it's all, especially in August, September, there's so many people coming in. Mm -hmm. There's students, and auxiliaries, and a lot of people trying to find apartments. So it can be kind of competitive, but if you're on top of your game, it's really easy. Also, there's a app called City Mapper, which is Google Maps for Madrid, which is super, super helpful. It shows all the public transportation. Cool. Can I add, though, um, so a lot of people love having the money on them so that they can put it down right away. I do want to add a caution there, though. There is a bit of pickpocketing in Madrid, um, so just be careful if you do decide to go that route. And then one thing I just want to add is that I actually took a different route of this whole thing and I had booked my apartment online before I even got to Spain. So I left the hotel and went straight to my um, apartment and it was so easy. I didn't have to waste any extra money and my apartment's absolutely gorgeous and a beautiful area and I'm very happy with the route that I took instead of freaking out and not being able to find something <laughs> and running around town. Cool. So, and how, how did you find that apartment? Um, I did use an online company, and they're just called, it's like BE Rumors, so B Rumors, and you do have to pay a little bit of amount, but they give you like a 10% off fee if you just, because um, they'll always message you when you get online. And so I only paid, I think, $90, and if you the place isn't what you um, want it to be, then they'll actually refund you your security deposit and um, they'll help you find a different place. Oh, cool. 
That's good. I'm going to um, take note of all the websites and apps that you guys are mentioning. Uh, and I'll, uh, when I email out the recording of the webinar to everyone, I'll, I'll email out all your suggestions as well. So feel free to throw those out there. Spot a home is another one that's similar to what was just mentioned. I think the fee is a little bit more expensive. It depends on your price range for an apartment, but it's like half to a third, so it's cheaper than an agency. Um, but sometimes it's nice to be able to see the apartment in person. It just depends on, on your preferences there. Cool. Uh, one quick question from a listener. Um, are you guys living with Spaniards, Americans? Who are you living with? Um, I have a variety. So there's five of us in my apartment, uh, me and two other Americans who I met through CIEE. And last semester I had two French guy roommates and they were just here for a semester because they were studying abroad. And now I have one French girl roommate and one Spanish guy roommate. So I've gotten a variety of mixes. There's lots of different languages being spoken in my apartment because some speak English, some speak Spanish, some speak French. So it's, it's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, mine is also all over the place. Um, but we mostly do speak only Spanish, um, unless it's between like me and the other American. And um, but I think having the mix really do is good because then you now have friends in Paris, or you might have made a new friend that lives in um, like Poland. So it's not so if you're you don't want to live with I've heard people say they don't want to live with people who don't speak Spanish or not Spanish. But I think it really does benefit because you're also learning together and you can help each other improve their Spanish. So. Cool. All right. Another question we have, um, what neighborhoods are you guys living in and why did you choose to live there? I started out in Retiro, which I really liked being right next to the park. That was amazing to be able to go there all the time. And it wasn't too far of a walk to the center. It was also um, closer to my school. Right now I live over by Casa de Campo, which is another huge park in Madrid that I also love. It's a little slightly further from my school, but it's um, also slightly closer to the center for me as well. Um, I live in Malasana, so I live literally in the smack dab in the middle. I live a block off Gran Villa, which is the center of seven. I really like it. Um, my street is actually surprisingly quiet, which I think is important. Um, I've never been woken up by loud noise outside on the street, um, but I just, I'm sure there's areas where that happens. Um, it's a nice area, not super expensive, lots of things to do, and really center, so it's you know, 10 minute walk to basically anything that I would want to get to. Cool. I also live in Malasana, so I'm probably right up the street with her, and I actually have one of the busier roads, so just make sure you're looking out for that one. Yeah, I'm sure, like, it, it all depends on the road, so, like, areas, be aware of where you're looking, because <clears throat> I, like, sleep, and I, if I got woken up a lot, I wouldn't be as happy as I am, but my street's very quiet, and I like that a lot. All right, uh, one, two more quick questions. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to keep us moving just because uh, I don't want to run out of time, and I know people The next topic are, uh, how much money do you spend for rent? Um, okay, actually three. How much money do you spend for rent? Do you find the stipend uh, to be a comfortable amount to live on? And how long are your leases? Feel free to chime in on any of those. I, I spend about 500 a month with all of the utilities included, which I find very doable on my stipend because I also 
um, earn extra through private classes, so I still have enough to go travel in addition to having a reasonable apartment. Um, and then what was the other part of that question? Sorry. Um, shoot, I just deleted it. <laughs> uh, oh, how long was the lease, lease. for? Yeah. Um, a lot of people like year-long leases, but if you're in a shared apartment, it's usually a little bit easier to find um, for a specific amount of months. Yeah, I pay um, about four fifty a month, and that's including utilities, so water, Wi-Fi, and my apartment actually. It has a cleaning lady that comes once a month, which is kind of a nice perk that I wasn't expecting to have. Um, I think that it's really doable on our monthly stipend. Um, I know that we'll be talking about private classes in just a little bit, um, but I do private classes, so I'm able to make a little bit extra money, and I travel a lot, so it's definitely doable. I haven't spent money from my account back home since like the first month that I was here. Um, I have a lease, when I signed my lease at the beginning of September, I signed it until June 30th. So Perfect. the amount of time that I was going to be in Spain anyway. Cool. All right. I think that's good for now. Let's move on to the next topic, and uh, I'll come back and answer any more questions or um, ask them out loud for our presenters at the end. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, a couple people, Alexandra and Christy, uh, I want you guys to mention a bit about your experience working at your host school. Let us know, uh, is it primary or secondary? What are the subject classes you're working in? And what does a normal schedule look like for you each week? Uh, Alexandra, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I work in a secondary school. Um, when I got there, they asked what I was interested in, and I was the only one that said that I like science. So I teach mostly um, chemistry and physics and then biology. And then I do have a couple English courses, and um, I also have one technology class. So. Um, I, my school is about an hour commute, and I completely chose that. I'm happy with my decision and whatnot. And um, I, my school is pretty awesome because they paid me and paid for my entire trip to go to Andorra and ski in the Pyrenees Mountains. So that was a really awesome uh, experience. And I know that another auxiliar is going to Scotland in two weeks with the class. And then um, my typical week is I'm there Mondays through Thursday. And one thing that I thought beforehand is I thought we were going to be working four days a week, um, I mean, sorry, four hours per day. But I actually, some days I work, uh, well, one day I work three hours, whereas another day I work five hours. Um, but I also really like my schedule because some days I don't have to be there till 11.30, whereas the long day I have to be there at 9 a.m. So I kind of like how it changes and I get to sleep in some days. It's nice. Cool. And Christy, tell us a bit about your experience. Christy, are you there? I'm not sure if we have Christy. I teach primary school, and I mostly work for second graders. Um, they're really can you hear me? Sorry, Christy, your audio is really funny. I don't know if that's happening for everyone, but to me it sounds kind of like it, it spaces out and then speeds up really quickly. It sounds like that might be happening for a couple people. Um, yeah. Christy, can you try? Can you hear me? Kind of. Let's see. Christy, why don't you um, just start talking a little bit, and I will butt in a little bit if I think we can't tell what you're saying. Hmm. 
Christy, I'm sorry, I'm still not hearing you. Um, if you want to sign out and sign back in, then that might work. Or feel free to type in any thoughts that you have. Hello. Oh, hi. Are you there? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I work four days a week. Um, Tuesday. Tuesday through Friday, um, and I really like my schedule because um, well, Christian, I'm losing you again. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what the... I work in the town of Hadafe, which is a, actually a... And then I... Um, let's see. Christy, um... Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Shoot. I'm so sorry. Um, it must be a fun, funky internet thing. Um... Christy, uh, if you wouldn't mind typing in some of your uh, comments, then I'm happy to read them out loud. And then maybe you could sign out and sign back in again. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Rebecca, could you tell us a little bit? You've worked now at two different schools. Uh, what are the differences mm -hmm. between the schools you've worked at? So the first time around, I worked in a primary school, and um, this awesome. time around, I'm working at a secondary school. Although it's a it's a brand new school, so they only have um, basically middle school there right now. So far, I've had really great experiences at both schools. In the primary school, I was just in the English classes um, with lots of sweet little kids, and now at the secondary school. I am actually mainly in the art classes, but I also have a few English classes as well. Um, and the kids are a lot of fun to work with. Um, it's a lot easier to play games with them since they're they're older. Um, and I've also done a few fun activities with them. I went hiking in the mountains around Madrid with them once for a field trip. Um, we've also gotten to see a play with them, so it's been a lot of fun. I work Monday through Thursday. Um, I start about 10 o'clock and work until about 2.30ish. My school was really on top of things and they emailed us ahead of time to ask us our preferences for our day off and the classes that we wanted to work on, work in, which was great. Um, our bilingual coordinator has been super flexible with us. We had um, a teacher who was absent for a while, so we helped the students stay on track. They had a substitute teacher, but um, we spent a little bit of extra time doing that, so we got to leave a little bit earlier for Christmas, which was nice. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, Christy, uh, do you want to try again with uh, brief uh, remarks on your school? I'm so sorry. I'm still not able to hear you, Christy. All right. I think we're going to move on to the next one, um, but hopefully we will be able to get your audio soon. Uh, Rebecca, now that you <laughs> have a lot of experience living in Spain, uh, can you tell <laughs> us about some cultural differences and adjustments that people need to make when they move there or that they might find difficult? Sure. Um... I think I'm at the point right now where I'm almost starting to forget how big some of the cultural differences are until I have people who come to visit. I'm like, oh yeah, that is different whenever they point something out. Um, this time of year, I think a lot of people are really starting to settle in. Um, but when you first get here, some of the things can be big. It's definitely a different pace of life. Things go a lot mm, slower here, which is great coming from working a full-time job in the U.S. Um, sometimes it can be a little frustrating, 
if the internet isn't getting installed as quickly as you would like or if um, people are taking their time and getting things done. Um, it's very relaxing, which is nice. Um, I think one of the things that I don't particularly care for is um, that there aren't as many bathrooms around Spain, or at least public bathrooms, so sometimes that can be a little bit frustrating. Um, personal space is another big difference if you're not used to um, really close <laughs> proximity to people. This might be something that you have to get used to. Um, they typically greet each other with kisses on, on each cheek and stand a little bit closer. Um, from where I'm from, we usually have a little bit more personal difference, so that was, or personal space, so that was definitely something to get used to as well. Um, let me see if I can think of any others off the top of my head. Um, there is a lot of, there are a lot of dogs around, and not everybody cleans up stuff, so sometimes you have to watch out where you're going. Um, walking is a huge part of the culture, so be prepared to bring lots of comfortable shoes. Also, people tend to meet outside of homes, not inside of homes, so a lot of people will hang out with friends on the street, they'll go out for dinner instead of inviting people into their homes. Um, and if somebody invites you to a coffee, usually they're intending to pay for you, and it's always polite to return the gesture at another point in time. Cool. And uh, for any of our panelists who this might be their first time living in Spain, uh, do you have any other striking cultural differences that you had to adjust to? Um, yeah, it's different, but I had a friend tell me when I first got here that it's not wrong, it's different. So there's going to be a lot of, um, I noticed a lot of people stare a lot more than what they do back home. Um, the proximity, they like to stand really close to you, which is something that I've had to adjust with as well, but it's never wrong, it's just different. Um, and as long as you can be open-minded and embrace the differences, then there will be no problem at all. Cool. All right, um, I'm going to go back just for a quick sec. I got some notes from Christy. Christy says, I work in a primary school and teach mostly first and second graders. I teach English and natural science and I work Tuesday through Friday. I've had such a great experience with my school. I work nine to four every day, but have a two hour lunch break. So it's good time to get to know the other teachers. Many times we go out to lunch together or go on a walk around the city of Hatafe. And I really enjoy that time uh, I get to spend with my coworkers. That's great. I definitely hear from participants that they, um, their experience in Spain has a lot to do with getting along well with their coworkers. Um, open question to all of you guys. Do you have any recommendations for people to uh, make a good first impression on their co-teachers? Something that was recommended to me during the orientation was making sure you go to the coffee hour with the teachers. And I think it was a really good recommendation. It helps you get to know the teachers. Um, it helps them to get to know that you're friendly and approachable. Um, and it's nice to have coffee in the middle of the day, too. I emailed my school, like, before I started working, so in September, after I had arrived to Spain, just to reach out to them um, to see if they needed anything from me. And I actually went to my school, like, a week before I started, just to meet the staff and kind of get a tour of the school, and I think that was really, really helpful. Um, my school doesn't have coffee hour, um, so we've had to, or I've had to connect with them outside of school. Um, we all have like a really good and open relationship because of that. Um, I think that just be super friendly, which I know everyone is, and work really hard and they'll appreciate it. Cool. 
Um, and a, a, a couple related questions. Um, do you find that the teachers and the bilingual coordinator at your school, are they open and welcoming to the uh, auxiliars? Um, or have you ever experienced any sort of negative preconceptions? I think it really depends on where you are. My bilingual coordinator is absolutely fantastic. Um, we have a WhatsApp group with all the auxiliaries, and we're always talking, and he always sends funny videos and pictures. And um, I've never felt at my school that, you know, I've been was in being treated differently or negatively, but I definitely have heard from, you know, other people who are placed around Spain that they haven't had the best experience, like, with their bilingual coordinator. Um, but from all the people that I've talked to that are like in CIE, I've heard all really good positive things. Yeah, I agree. My um, I don't know, head of department, head of the English department, um, she, my school has never had an American auxiliar. And so this is the first time. And they we actually have two this year. And so they've been really open and kind of excited to learn about um, culture in the United States, um, you know, the differences between British and American English, and they've been really open-minded and receptive to us, and they've been super nice. Like, um, a couple weeks ago, I was really, really sick, and I tried to come to work, and they were just like, no, you go home, and they, like, then they brought me medicine. <laughs> so they're just like really, really nice people. Um, overall, I've had a good experience. Yeah, I have a really sweet bilingual coordinator too. She has monthly meetings with the teachers that we work with and then with us just to make sure that um, we're all good, that we're on the same page, if there's anything that we need. And the teachers have all been really sweet and friendly too, making sure we get invited to any of the after school things that the teachers go to or any in school parties or whatnot that the teachers have. So overall it's been a great experience. Great. And there was one more question involving the schools. Um, what attire or clothes or uniform um, should people expect to have to wear when teaching? You can I wear whatever you want and it's great. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> On the school like I was told that you shouldn't wear sandals, um, but my school, like, you can wear sandals. Um, I've worn anything from dresses and skirts to jeans. I wore a sweatshirt. I mean, it was like a nice sweatshirt, but, like, I wore a sweatshirt to school. Um, as long as you aren't showing up looking like you literally just rolled out of bed, then you'll be fine. <laughs> I think it's important to always be dressed at least one step above the students, if not a little bit more. I mean, with that said, though, I typically wear, like, jeans and flats or jeans and, like, a nice pair of, like, dress sandals um, to work. Sometimes I wear slacks. Um, it's a little, I think it's a little bit more casual but a little bit smarter than the U.S. at the same time, <laughs> if that makes sense. Cool. Great. All right. I think that's it for teaching questions for the moment. Uh, let's go on to Hannah. Can you tell us a bit about your experience uh, personally with commuting and also maybe what you've heard from other people about commuting um, and using public yeah. transit in general? Yeah. So um, when I first came to Spain uh, during orientation with CIE, they helped you get what's called an abono and it's like your public transportation card. Um, if you're under 26, you pay like 20 euros a month, and it's unlimited public transportation within any part of the community of Madrid. So that includes the bus, the train, the metro, anything, which is awesome, um, which is it's super cheap. Um, I use the metro to get to work, uh, my school's in the city center, so it's about a 20-minute commute on the metro, but I have a roommate, and she has about an hour and a half commute, and, you know, she takes the Cercanias, which is a type of train, and a bus. So the public transportation in Madrid is 
super easy to navigate. Um, like the metro, you go in and it literally tells you where it's going. So easy to handle. Um, I know when I first used it, I was a little confused because where I'm from back home, we don't have public transportation, but super easy to navigate. Um, I had mentioned it earlier. There's a map that, or a app that I use called City Mapper. My orientation leader uh, through CIE told me about it, and it's like Google Maps, but specifically for Madrid. And you can plug in an address, a location, and it'll pull up walking directions, train, bus, metro, the times that it'll come. It's super, super ridiculously handy, and it's free. So highly recommend that. Um, I think commuting's pretty easy. I know a lot of people, like I said, who commute an hour or so, but living in the city center is definitely worth it, in my opinion. So commuting shouldn't be an issue. Cool. Great. Thank you. All right, and uh, on to the next one. Uh, both Rebecca and Christy mentioned wanting to talk about traveling, uh, vacations. Um, basically, where have you gone? Um, what do you find are challenges about traveling? Um, and what are some recommendations you have for people when they're looking to travel? Uh, Rebecca? Um, one recommendation I would have um, to start with is wait to plan any trips until you have housing. Um, I know a lot of people had already booked trips like the first week or two that they got in and then were really stressed because they didn't find housing as quickly as they thought they were going to. Um, with that said, I've already been to a fair number of countries and places around Spain. I usually do um, one country a month and one place within Spain a month, so I get at least two trips in. So, so far I've been to Austria, England, Thailand, um, the United Arab Emirates, um, and then within Spain I've been to Salamanca, Toledo, um, and the mountains around the community of Madrid as well. Um, I would highly recommend for Christmas being with your family. Um, I have a few friends who um, wanted to take advantage of the two weeks and then really regretted not being with their family and traveling to other places instead. You do have about two and a half weeks though, so you can do both if that's what you wanted. My sister happens to live in Thailand, so I wound up doing that, which was a lot of fun. The great thing about Madrid is that there are um, buses and a metro that go directly to the airport, so it's super easy to get there. The Madrid airport has flights to pretty much everywhere, so it's really easy to find a pretty cheap and direct flight. I mentioned at the beginning that I like Ryanair and I use them fairly often. <laughs> they can be a little bit more of a hassle though. Um, I also use eDreams, like the letter E, the word dreams.com, to find um, cheap flights and I really like using Airbnb for accommodations. Um, as far as vacations go, we have days off pretty much every single month in addition to having a three-day weekend every weekend. So it's really easy to find time um, with what you're given from school and then your three-day weekends as well. So there's plenty of time for it. Great. and. Uh... Christy, you want to try chiming in and or you can always type in your notes and I'd be happy to read them out loud. I'm still not able to hear you, Christy. I'm so sorry. Um, again, I'm happy to read any anything you type in out loud. Um, other than that, our other panelists, do you have any quick tips about traveling when you're based in Madrid? Um, yeah, I have traveled. Can, can you hear me? Um, yeah. Oops, sorry, I don't know who that was talking, but continue. Um, it was me. I stopped because I thought Christy was going to be able to speak. But um, 
I have traveled quite a bit. Um, I have been to eight countries in six months, um, and I've been to six cities in Spain. Um, I think it's really easy and doable. Um, flights are so cheap. Um, you know, the cheapest flight I bought was like 20 euros. Um, so super easy and doable, especially if you do the private lessons. Um, yeah, I highly recommend it. See as much as you can. Do as much as you can. Um, it's really funny because I just went on a trip this weekend and Alexander was the one who <laughs> uh, helped me play it a little bit. So um, lots to see. Europe's really easy to get around. Even with Spain, you can take a train or fly anywhere. So I highly recommend it. If you can do it, do it. Awesome. All right, cool. Uh, thank you. And uh, let's head on to the next one. Uh, private tutoring. Hannah, can you tell us a bit about uh, the private tutoring that you've been doing? And um, we had one question from someone already about tutoring. Would you, uh, what or I guess this could also uh, apply to teaching at your host school, but what materials have you found useful um, that you would recommend people bring from the U.S.? Yeah, so um, I do six private lessons a week. So I do two on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, I don't work on Monday, so I didn't want to have classes on that day, and Friday's... A Friday so I wanted to be done a little bit early. Um, I think it's definitely doable with six. I know some people who do less, some people who probably do a little bit more, but um, I make enough money every month doing private lessons to pay for my rent, which is super nice. Um, there's Facebook groups, so you'll be added to a CIEE Facebook group, but there's also Facebook groups for auxiliaries in Spain and specifically in Madrid. Um, and that's how I found my private lessons. So people will post on their different lessons either because they're moving or their schedule changed, whatever it may be. And I found one family through that and they just had a bunch of friends who also wanted private lessons. So. A lot of people want to learn English. They're really excited and eager to learn, which is awesome. Um, I have my youngest. So I teach in a secondary school, so I have older kids during the day. Um, but my private lessons, my youngest is five, and my oldest is nine. Um, and they're all in bilingual schools, and their level of English is very, very high. Um, my nine-year-olds, I've never spoken to them in Spanish. Um, what I do with them is that um, a lot of times we re review material that they've done in school, you know, practice, um, test prep, reviewing, stuff like that. Um, I think that's really helpful um, and useful for them, obviously. And a lot of times um, I play games with them obviously in English, but it makes the students really excited because they can play games but also be learning English at the same time. So I'm lucky one of my family that I do lessons for has tons of games, and so we just do that for like 20 minutes or so to get them kind of in the groove of speaking English, and then we do reviewing. Um, I have found different games or activities online. I didn't bring any material from home because I've never taught English before, so I wasn't really sure what to expect, but it's super easy to find lessons online or activities or games or, um, like I said, the students have their English book, so you can look at that and come up with different activities or review with that. It's Definitely worth it. I would highly recommend private tutoring if you can do it. Great. And how do you decide how much to charge per hour? 
Yeah, um, I, when I was in orientation, they talked about private tutoring, because, um, I don't know, I've never taught in Spain before, I wasn't sure what to charge, um, and they said that usually the going rate for a native English speaker is 20 euros an hour. Um, I have one family that does 15 euros an hour, um, but everyone else, I charge 20 euros an hour. Cool. I just want to chime in and say that sometimes you'll get people that say, oh, 15 or 20 is too expensive, but honestly, you have some of these people you might have to go on the metro for, you know, it takes 30, 40 minutes to get there. So if you think about the time you're spending getting there and preparing the work, paying only paid like $10 or less isn't worth it, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, like I can do uh, about 30 minutes, 40 minutes to my private lessons, and I'm lucky because they're all neighbors, um, but yeah, by the time I commute out there and come home, it kind of balances out, um, so 20 euros isn't that expensive, especially with a native English speaker. Certainly. Great. And um, where do you usually tutor your private clients? At their home, or is there some other place you would go? Um, I do my private lessons at their house, so I go to their apartment, um, which I thought was going to be really weird at first, but it's basically, like if you've ever been like a babysitter or anything like that, it's kind of similar because you're going to their house, but you're teaching them instead. Um, so I've been able to get to know the, their parents, their families, um, some of them have their grandparents that live with them. Um, so I've been able to speak with them and get to know them, which is really nice. Um, get a little taste of Spanish culture in that way as well. Definitely. Cool. All right. Well, that sounds good. Um, I have a quick note from Christy about traveling that I want to throw out there. Christy says her biggest tip about traveling is to make a budget each month um, to include some money for traveling. She tries to travel twice a month. Uh, but the most important thing is to plan ahead uh, and set aside money so that you still make sure you have plenty of uh, money for groceries and having fun in Madrid. Thank you, Christy. And on to eating. Um, Christy, feel free to type in your thoughts about eating in Spain. Um, I'm thinking groceries are interesting to hear about, uh, restaurants. Um, feel free to chime in if you can. Otherwise... Um, Alexandra, Hannah, Rebecca, do you guys have any thoughts about grocery shopping or going out to restaurants? I love going out to eat here. It's relatively inexpensive compared to the U.S. Um, a coffee is like less than a dollar fifty. A beer is around the same to two. Um, it's nice because a lot of the restaurants will have very similar Spanish food, so you can go pretty much anywhere and order tortilla or jamón or cheese or anything like that. Um, Madrid is a much more international city, so they have more international food than you might find in other places around Spain, which is always nice if you have a hankering for Indian or for tacos or something um, along those lines, and it's fun to go and explore new places and new restaurants. Um, the grocery stores aren't as big or as diverse as a lot of grocery stores are in the U.S. Lavapiés is a neighborhood in Madrid that has a lot of um, international people living there, so they have a little bit more along those lines. Um, if you haven't been to Spain before, be prepared for the jamón legs, the pig legs that are hanging up everywhere. It's very tasty, though, so highly recommend. Great. Also, just to target, um, I spend about 20 to 24 dollars a week on food, but I know some people who spend less and more. So it just depends on what you're getting. But food is relatively cheap, especially fruits and vegetables. And would you say you're spending yeah. that much money at restaurants, or including groceries, or both? Sorry, that just includes groceries specifically. Um, restaurants. 
you I love the menu of the day they have because you can get you know the appetizer, main meal, a dessert, and a drink for you know eight to twelve euros depending on where you are, which is really awesome. Cool. It just depends where you're going. Like you can find expensive restaurants, but you can also find really cheap and awesome restaurants. Cool. The one big difference I found is um, the eating time. They typically eat a little bit later than what um, I was used to back home. Um, so back home I would eat lunch around noon, and here they typically eat lunch at, starting at like 2, and then they don't eat dinner until, I don't know, like between 8 and 10 p.m., um, so it was a little bit of an adjustment, getting used to the different time change, but the food here is delicious. Um, groceries are pretty cheap. Everything's relatively cheap, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> cool. In, in some places, you also get free tapas, like little dishes with your drinks too. So sometimes my friend and I will go and just buy drinks and we'll wind up having a free dinner because of it. I love tapas. Gosh, I miss that. <laughs> Cool. Um, I also have a note from Christy. Christy says the best part about Madrid is how low cost the eating is. Uh, she pays about 20 euros a month for groceries and then can cook for the week. Uh, also, Madrid is such a big city that I've been here for six months and almost have never been to the same restaurant twice. I love exploring the food scene. Uh, it's such an international city. There are all types of restaurants, including Spanish, Italian, American, Mexican, Moroccan, Ethiopian, etc. Um, she corrected that 20 euros a week for that week's groceries. Great. Uh, and we have one question from a listener. Uh, how do you feel about the options for vegetarians, vegans, um, people that have more restricted diets? What's it like living in Madrid? Um, I don't eat beef, um, and I know that's not full vegetarian, but um, I've never had an issue. Um, like Chrissy said, there's food from everywhere, so you're going to find any types of options. I know close to me there's a full vegan restaurant. Um, in certain grocery stores, they have, like, the gluten-free um food just like they do at home. Uh, it might be a little bit more expensive, but there's still the option for it. Sometimes the people here don't understand dietary restrictions um, in the same way that they do in the U.S., but um, as she just said, there are a lot of options here. I went to a vegetarian restaurant the other day called La Biotica, and it was really good. Um, and there are also a lot of health food stores here outside of the grocery store as well. Cool. Uh, and what is the water quality like in Madrid? It's totally 100% perfectly fine water. <laughs> yeah, I drink. I drink from my sink. Like I might have to buy a water, like a water bottle, when I'm out walking around or something. But I bring it home and I refill it from my sink and reuse it. I've never had an issue. Yeah, Madrid has yes. excellent drinking water here. It's really nice. Cool. Uh, one other question we had was for Christy. Uh, one person wanted to know, what are you buying and eating that you can only pay 20 euros a month? Uh, we corrected that to 20 euros a week, uh, and she chimed in to say that she usually buys chicken, um, a box of pasta, spaghetti sauce, uh, and then a bunch of fruits and vegetables. I would say that sounds pretty good. All right. Yeah, I've eaten a lot more vegetables and fruit since coming to Spain. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Um, it's just, well, one, I don't know how to cook that much food. <laughs> <laughs> and so eating fruits and veggies are really nice and filling, um, but also it's just so cheap. Yeah. You know, I can buy a giant bag of apples that has like a dozen apples in it for less than two euros. Yeah. And so that will last me quite a while. Um, so it's been a really nice, healthy change. Cool. Great. All right. Uh, let's get on to the next question. All right. This is to all of you, and it's kind of my last uh, topic, was just everyone's top advice for those first couple weeks in Spain to make the transition easier. 
Uh, and then I'll just I'll just ask all four of you. How about uh, Alexandra? Can you tell us what do you think you would recommend for people uh, to do or how to approach moving to Spain to make the transition easy? Um, well, first of all, I think CIE does a really, really amazing job with getting us settled. They set up all the appointments for getting your ID done, getting your card. So um, aside from all they do and help out with, definitely go out of your comfort zone. Um, make new friends. Don't be afraid to set up going on a trip. I know the first week I was there, some people I met at the orientation and I, we went to Toledo and just... Don't be afraid to take chances, try the new food, and just kind of go um, submerge yourself in the culture and don't be afraid of anything. It's really awesome. <laughs> be fearless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Christy, please type in any advice you have that you want to share, and I can share that out loud. Uh, Hannah, what are some advice that you have for people those first few weeks? Yeah, um, I was super nervous coming here. The, I, I had been to Europe before, but the first time that I had been to Spain was when I stepped off the plane when I came at the end of August. Um, I definitely agree. Step out of your comfort zone. Um, the first couple months were a little stressful um, because um, you haven't started working yet, um, so you haven't been getting paid. Um, you're trying to find an apartment and get all the logistics worked out, you know, getting a phone, getting your bono. Um, but I would just say, like, take a deep breath. Like, everything is going to work out, and it's all worth it. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier that Spain is a little bit more relaxed. Um, so really take that to heart, kind of relax, enjoy it. Um, it goes by really, really fast. Um, Travel as much as you can, see as much as you can, immerse yourself in the culture. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great experience. Um, do everything. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, Christy chimed in. She said, uh, do not stress. I promise you will find an apartment. Stay open-minded. An opportunity may arise that you might never have considered. Try to explore the neighborhoods of Madrid so you can see what really fits your personality. Also, think about where you are living based on where you're working to help you find the best commute possible. Great advice. And uh, Rebecca, what's some advice you have? I would say try to get everything done right away, especially before you have to start teaching because then your time starts getting eaten up a little bit more. Um, I think Alexandra said that CAE does a really good job of helping you get set up. Like at orientation, they have um, a cell phone provider there to help you get that set up. They have someone to help you get your abono, your metro card set up. Those are all great to have right away for the apartment hunt. And then the sooner you get the paperwork done, the more time you have to worry about where you're going to travel to next. Um, with paperwork, sometimes people expect different things. So what I've found is try to bring everything that you can think you might possibly need and then don't be afraid to um, push back a little bit politely of course um, but I found sometimes somebody will ask for me to do something else and um, I can get away with what I have by politely asking for it to be okay. <laughs> and just as like a second comment, um, do a little bit of research beforehand about like you know the culture, everything, and don't just come here. And be like, okay, I'm here now. What do I do? Research your the banks, everything. I mean, CIE does do a lot for you, but definitely look at all your options. I'd also say go out and meet people. There are a lot of like intercambios and stuff like that where you can go and practice your Spanish. Um, you'll probably get more private classes later on, and like I said, your time might get eaten up. So go out and meet lots of people and explore the city when you first get in. And I found um, opportunities to volunteer here. Um, that's something that I'm passionate about back home. and. There's lots of different organizations that you can get involved with or 
help out uh, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, like I said earlier, there's always something to do in Spain, so you should never feel bored or anything like that. Awesome. Great. Uh, all right, I think I'm going to move on to the uh, Q&A section. Oh, just as a reminder to anyone who's still applying, the application deadline is March 1st. Um, it's a little bit flexible, so if you need some more time, uh, that's certainly fine. Though I think we're filling up faster this year than last year. Um, that being said, uh, you can find all the information on our website, ciee.org slash teach. And I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, I already have a few here that have been coming in. Uh, let's see. One person wants to know, uh, Rebecca, you mentioned pickpocketing. Um, what, what is that like? What has your experience uh, been like with pickpocketing? What advice do you have to avoid pickpocketers? Is it OK to use your uh, smartphone in public? What are your thoughts on that? So yeah, it's definitely okay to use your smartphone in public. Just be aware of your surroundings. Um, I've never personally been pickpocketed. I have a purse that I wear kind of over the shoulder strapped in front of me with a zipper. Um, I know some people have seen pickpocketers like reaching hands into bags on the metro. I actually saw four little pickpocketers running around a Starbucks near the Prado and a barista trying to chase them out. Um, if you go out at night, be extra careful because that seems to be when it happens. As long as you're smart about it and you pay attention, you should be fine. But I do know a few people who have had um, phones or wallets stolen. So it's just like any big city in the tourist areas, you just have to be a little bit extra careful. And I would recommend, um, I almost got my phone stolen twice. <laughs> um, it was when I was at a restaurant and I had my phone sitting on the table. Um, and people will notice that, um, and they will try and come by and sneakily try and grab it. Um, so I would recommend that if you have your phone at a restaurant, you know, keep it in your bag, uh, keep it in your hand, keep it anywhere that they, you know, wouldn't be able to just grab and go. Absolutely. Christy uh, agrees with you. She says, don't put things in your back pocket and don't leave your phone on the table when eating at a restaurant. I would definitely say pickpocketing is one of the few woes that our participants have when living in Spain. Um, Christy, if you wouldn't mind typing in any comments, we had one question for you um, because you were an immersion participant uh, about how much Spanish you feel like you've learned. Um, and, uh, yeah, just how much Spanish have you learned? How comfortable do you feel speaking Spanish? Um, the rest of you were at an intermediate or higher level, but uh, I guess if anyone has any thoughts about how their Spanish has improved or recommendations about how people can improve Spanish during their time there, that would be cool. I think whenever you immerse yourself in a country where they speak another language, you're going to pick it up a lot faster. It definitely helps to have people at home to talk in Spanish to, like a host family. It's a great way to get to know the culture right away, to get to know some of the food right away. Um, a lot of people who didn't do it, though, I know, have gone to, like I said, the intercambios, or they've gotten a private Spanish tutor, or they've gone to one of the academies that offers Spanish lessons as well. Perfect. All right. Um, let's see. Have you ever had to take a few days off? How is that handled from your school? Are they understanding? Um, and what's that process look like? So I've been, um, I'm actually sick again right now. I've been pretty sick um, for the past like two months. Um, once I got sick, I could never fully get better just because I'm around children who are always sick as well. Um, not that that should deter you away. Um, kids will be kids. <laughs> um, I was really sick about two or three weeks ago, um, and I went into work, and they actually sent me home because I was too sick. Um, and then I didn't go to school the next day. They st during orientation, they told me that I would need a justificante, which is like a 
basically like a doctor's note. Um, but my school was super understanding. Um, they didn't need it. They saw me and saw how miserable and sick I was, and they knew that all I needed was to stay in bed and to drink lots of fluids. Um, so with that aspect, my school has been super flexible. Um, I know that we had an auxiliar at my school who had a family emergency and had to leave for a month, and they were super flexible with that as well. So I think it depends a lot on your school and their flexibility and kind of what they're comfortable with. Um, communication is key, so when you communicate well with them, it's going to be definitely beneficial for you. Definitely would agree with that as well. Um, I missed school twice because one time I had really bad food poisoning and I had to go to the hospital, which having the coverage with CIE has been really awesome and easy. And then um, this, I was just really sick last week with the flu, and I just told I texted my boss and said, I can't come in, I'm dying. And he said, okay, no worries. And I said, I'll just come in um, early next Monday, and I'll work the three hours I'm missing, and that was that. Had, had I haven't had, had to miss a school for uh, even health hours. Oops, sorry. Nope, it's okay. Go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering, have any of you missed school for things other than health reasons? Um, and if so, how did that work? Oh, I was going to, I think, answer that next. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I haven't had to take off any health days. I have been a little sick, but nothing that kept me from school, thankfully. Um, I have like I said, taken off um, early for Christmas. Um, the bilingual coordinator was totally fine with that, and even when we first got there, said, hey, if you guys want to head out a little early for Christmas or at the end of the school year, just make up your hours ahead of time. So I guess I haven't really officially taken off time. I've just made it up elsewhere. Um, but in March, the students have exams, and some of the teachers told me that because there are so many exams going on that I'm probably not going to be doing a whole lot that week, so I got permission to head out earlier for um, cheaper flights, which they were okay with. I don't do that very often because I don't want to take advantage of it or have a bad relationship with the teachers, but um, it has been something that I've been able to do um, here and there. Great. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, uh, my school is letting me make up hours so that I could um, – leave a little bit early at the end of the year, um, but like uh, Rebecca said, I'm not necessarily missing work because I'm making up the hours and I'm still going to get paid for it. Um, I did ask off for one day um, because my parents are coming <laughs> and I need to pick them up from the airport. Um, they don't speak Spanish <laughs> and I've never been to Spain, So, but my school was super, and they're coming and uh, April, so they're, they've been super good about letting me go early, especially since I gave them so much time notice. Um, they've been awesome. Cool. All right, great. Um, let's see, a few more questions. Here's a quick and easy one. Is it hard to get football tickets? No. No. <laughs> <They're not> available. <laughs> Uh, I literally had someone posted on, like, the CIE page and was like, hey, I have an extra ticket for next week's game. Does anyone want to go? And I said, yeah. And it was just super easy. Um, <laughs> and that's not even through the website. But there's there's soccer tickets everywhere, always. <laughs> cool. Um, oh, Christy had chimed in about her experience learning Spanish. Um, she says she's come a long way with her Spanish. So Christy did the two-week immersion program. Were you usually looking for kind of an advanced beginner or a low intermediate level of Spanish for that two-week immersion program? Uh, and Christy says, wow, I've come a long way. Uh, I came over hardly speaking much Spanish at all, and now I'm conversational. I'm not fluent, but I've picked it up very fast. I feel comfortable talking to people. Um, the best advice I have is to be confident and not to be afraid to make mistakes because that's the best way to learn is to really force yourself to practice. Um, she participates in intercambios. However, it's very easy to get around Madrid only speaking English. Uh, so if you want to learn, it's important to put yourself out there. 
She also says, it is not difficult to get football tickets unless you want to go to a big rivalry game. Otherwise, she's been to several. <laughs> Great. Yeah, the Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid tickets are so expensive because it's a big rivalry, but anything else is pretty cheap and pretty reasonable, so it's, it's good. Great. Um, for those of you who did not take TEFL um, or did not have teaching experience, um, how did you feel about starting teaching? Uh, what are resources that you have found helpful? Um, is there anything else you would recommend in order to prepare to teach? Um, I didn't do TEFL, and I have no teaching experience. Oh, that's not true. I mean, like, I've been a nanny and tutor back home, but never, I've never taught in a classroom. Um, I remember, like, my first week, I was super, super nervous. But it's not that bad. Um, you know, sometimes I have to lesson plan. Um, sometimes... I, the teacher does the lesson planning, and I just lead the lesson. Um, so it's been really, really great. The teachers have been really helpful. Um, you know, there's, it's not too overwhelming. It's definitely doable for someone who doesn't have teaching experience or anything like that. Great. Um, okay, I'm going to do just a couple more questions. So here's a pretty quick one. Um, tell us about your phone plans. Uh, how much do you spend per month, and what does it include? And I guess, do you recommend your plan? I have Orange, which is the one that CIE helped set us up with at orientation. Basically, it's twenty. I pay twenty dollars a month. Um, Fifteen of that is for two gigs of data over the course of a month, and the rest is for phone calls. Um, I actually don't use it all up within a month. Um, I recommend it. I know there are other good phone plans out there, but I've been pretty happy with it because it's easy to connect to Wi-Fi at my school, at my house, um, or at coffee shops out about, etc. Even the buses have Wi-Fi. And what company is that? Orange. Great. Anyone else? I have Vodafone. Um, I had <laughs> a not so great experience with Orange. Uh, my first two weeks in Spain and switched to Vodafone and have had them ever since. Um, I, my roommate has Joygo. There's lots of different phone companies, but they're all pretty similar. Um, I pay 20 euros a month for four gigabytes of data, and I don't use all of it at all. Um, like Rebecca said, it's so easy to connect to Wi-Fi at your apartment or at restaurants or anything like that. Um, but I think it's important to have some sort of phone just so you can connect with people when you need to. <laughs> Definitely. And uh, let's see, Christy says she uses Vodafone and that she has practically the same plan. Uh, she pays 20 euros for two gigabytes of data and 100 minutes of phone calls. It's more than sufficient. Uh, Christy also uh, wanted to pass on uh, about teaching English if you don't have a TEFL certificate or teaching experience. Um, teaching English is easy because it's so natural. You are an English expert. As long as you have um, some experience working with kids or you're comfortable working with kids, it comes naturally. And it's also a learning experience. You'll learn along the way what things can help the kids and what things don't. Thanks, Christy. All right. And um, oh, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to add one thing into the phone. If you want to use your phone from home, make sure you get it unlocked before you come over. Otherwise, that might be a little bit of a hassle. Definitely. We mentioned that again during the pre-departure orientation. And uh, if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to help, though probably your cell phone carrier is the best person to talk to. Um, next fairly quick question. We're pretty much out of time. But um, quickly, what did you guys, or how much did you guys pack? Um, what do you regret bringing that you don't need, or what do you wish you had packed? I had um, one check, check bag, which was like 50 pounds is what you can bring, and then I had like a carry-on suitcase and a backpack. Um, it was definitely enough. I think I brought too many clothes. Um, 
I mean, I bought things here that I kind of needed. Like, I didn't bring um, a scarf, but for wintertime, I needed a scarf. But you can find stuff like that super cheap. Um, things that I should have brought. Um, maybe, like, another sweatshirt for when it does get cold. But it's definitely doable if you pack it right. You, I know some people who brought, like, two check bags and then, like, a carry-on suitcase and a backpack, and that just seems like so much stuff to me. Definitely. Um, I did it in one check bag, and, was, and I brought all my toiletries from home, so it was definitely sufficient enough. Great. Any other thoughts? I was on... I was one of those people who brought the two check bags and two carry-ons. I was also planning on staying here for a couple years, though, um, renewing and all of that. Um, it was still definitely too much, though. It's really annoying to have to carry around from the airport to the hotel to an Airbnb. I probably brought too many heavy sweaters. Um, Madrid doesn't get very cold in the winter, but a sweatshirt is really nice because sometimes the apartments do get a little chilly. Great. Christy says, don't pack too much. Shopping in Madrid is amazing and super cheap. I only took one checked bag of 50 pounds and a carry-on, uh, and I regret bringing the amount of clothes I did. Um, you can bring a winter jacket and shoes, but don't overdo it on the clothes. Great. All right, and uh, our last question, I think a good one to wrap it up with. Um, kind of starting aimed at Rebecca. Rebecca, why have you chosen to use CIEE specifically three times? And then kind of <laughs> everyone, um, did you look at other programs besides CIEE and what made you choose CIEE? So my first time around in Spain, I studied abroad with CIEE. They had a program that went directly with my major and I loved it. Um, my first time around teaching, second time in Spain, I did CIEE. I wasn't um, familiar with the other processes, and I already knew I had a great experience with CIEE um, and was very happy to do the orientation through them since I had only studied abroad for a summer, six weeks, and wanted a little bit of extra help. The This time around, it was about... Uh, five years in between teaching and I was working about 50 hours a week so I wanted the basics help just to have a smoother easier transition um, and get all the extra help that they offered I know you can also apply through the government which is what I'll do to renew um, but I really liked having the extra bit of help that CIE offered great Without CIE, I would have been completely lost. I would probably have already been kicked out of the country if I didn't have their help. So um, I really do recommend it. And um, some people ask, why is it so expensive or what does the money go to? And it goes towards so much stuff. Um, so I really recommend it. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. I, I, there's so much, like, paperwork. Um, I mean, even before I got here, like, CIE was helping me with my visa. Um, then when I got here, they helped with my phone and my bono and my TA and all these things. And it would have been, it was slightly overwhelming just because, like, I knew that there was so much that I needed to do. But they made it so much less stressful because they were helping me along the way. Like, they were helping me make appointments and they were helping me navigate the city, um, helping me get around and do all these things that I needed to do, um, I would have been really, really stressed out and nervous, more nervous than I was if I didn't have CIE's help along the way. And even now, six months in, I know that if I have an issue or a problem, I can email CIE or go to their office and tell them my, my, my problem and they will help me still. <laughs> Great. Well, I doubt you guys would have been kicked out of the country, but we're definitely happy to help uh, smooth the transition. Uh, I know I have to work with the Ministry of Education, and I it's somewhat frustrating, and I'm really glad you guys don't need to do that too much. So... <laughs> Um, oh, Christy also mentioned that CIE was an amazing help in making the smooth transition to moving this to Madrid. 
Uh, through CIE, they'll give you support through the necessary government documents, transportation, finding an apartment, et cetera, that I would have been lost without their support. Uh, also, it's an amazing way to meet other people in your same position moving to Madrid. It's nice to know that you're not alone, and it's a great way to make friends when moving to a foreign country. Cool. Um, so I think that's about it. I thank you guys so much for giving us an hour and 40 minutes of your time. Um, if you have any last uh, thoughts, feel free to share them. Otherwise, I think we had a, a good number of attendants, and they're pretty excited to hear from you. Thank you. All right. I think that's it for questions, and I'm going to close it off. Um, I'll be reaching out to you guys to send you a thank you, and um, I, it was really a treat to hear from you. Uh, all right. <laughs> you guys have a great rest of your spring in Madrid, and yeah. I hope you guys end up staying in Spain another year, either through CIE or not, because it's a pretty awesome place. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys.